Well, folks, uh, this is the beginning, the first part of this mini-series. I don't know how long it's going to go, but this is something that's very important to me because, as you see behind me, this place is beautiful. This is actually Bishop's Harbor. This is where a lot of that bad water um, that is, is dumped into from Piney Point. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a timeline with this whole situation of when it when Piney Point first started which is back in 1966 and where it is today so it's going to take us a little bit of time to get to that period and to cover everything that we need to cover because there's so much more involved so let's go ahead and go to the place where this first all started and we just want to show you that even to this day it's still a problem and still going to be a problem until we can get somebody to actually fix this. So let's go ahead and go to the location to where this all started. Well folks, this is the gypsum stack part of it that has created this whole issue and has been an ongoing issue since 2001, actually even before that, but when the records have been being kept um, starting in 2001 when the FDEP took over this site from Royster they've had 21 years to fix this problem or 20 years actually and they still have not fixed this problem and they dump right into the bay and it it caused a massive red tide this year as we all know so we're going to go through this and get to the bottom of it and and find out who exactly is involved so let's go ahead and start talking about exactly what's going on here, who's been involved, and how long they've been involved. All right, let's go ahead and start with the timeline of how Tiny Point started as a phosphate company and, and try to move through this timeline in this first part of the series. Of course, Borden Chemical in 1966 started the phosphate mining out at Piney Point. So anyway, back in 1966, they started the process phosphate, which is a key ingredient to fertilizer. By 1970, they discovered that the board was dumping wastewater directly into Tampa Bay and into Bishop's Heart, resulting in fish kills. So the plant changed hands multiple times in the 80s, beginning with Borden transferring the property to Amex Phosphate in 1980. Amex in turn sold the plant in 1986 to FCS Energy which was absorbed into Consolidated Minerals. By 1988 the plant had changed hands once again to Royster Phosphate. In 1989 a leaking storage tank released 23,000 gal 23, gallons of sulfate that prompted evacuations of the area. Two separate incidents in 1991 uh, released sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide into the air, killing three workers, and uh, it, it actually caused 30 people to become ill. The FBI seized company records in 1992. Then Mulberry Corporation purchased the plant in 1993 when Royster Phosphate Phosphates declared bankruptcy. Mulberry ceased operations at the plant in 1999 due to lack of funds. In January 2001, Mulberry abandoned the property just 48 hours after notifying the government that it could no longer afford to assure environmental security and days before declaring bankruptcy. Then the Federal Environmental Protection Agency took it over and then they handed the reins to the FDEP, which have had it since 2001. So they have had from 2001, they've had so much time to correct this problem. And in 2004, Hurricane Francis caused a hole in the dike, releasing 70 million U.S. gallons of contaminated water. So, real quick breakdown of all that. You can see that the plant had changed hands multiple times. And back in 1966, Manatee County was actually having hearings talking about Borden starting this phosphate company because they were concerned with the environment and concerned with what it could, if, if something happened, what it would cause. So back in 1966, they still had environmental concerns with this, but there was too much money involved for, these, for, for the county to, to sidestep this, to, to not let it happen. So they let it happen, and here we are today. 
So in 2006, actually let's let's go back a little bit. Before 2006, in 2003, the FDP, FDEP contracted a company by the name of CDM. CDM Contractors. They were awarded a 50, almost a 53 million dollar contract to come in and take care of that land and take care of that gypsum stack. And eventually by 2005, 2006, they were hoping to have it closed down completely. But then the DEP had other plans. They wanted to make the dike, they wanted to come in and make the gypsum stacks not look like a liability, but they wanted to make them look like a, a um, asset. So what they did is they went around and they, they went after companies and said, hey, if you buy this land, you can do this with it. You can, you can uh, use it as uh, storage to, uh, for dump material. You can do this, you can do that. Enhance. So CDM, Command Co, and FDP had control of this land and they decided that in 2006, FDP, FDEP, they were gonna sell the land to HRK Holdings. Well, HRK Holdings came in to bought the land for $4.3 million. And, but at the same time, there was an agreement between the DEP and Command Co, CDM, and HRK Holdings that those, those entities still continue to take care of the land because HRK Holdings was not a land management company. They were a hedge fund. So they were buying into this thinking that this could be a good investment. They can make money off of the dredge material and other things on that property, make it into a terminal for rails and trucking. So they had this grand scheme that they were they were kind of thrust into this believing that they could do all this stuff to this land and then that the FDEP Command Co. and CDM was still going to take care of the land in, in the aspect of the gypsum gypsum stack. So HRK Holdings really didn't have anything to do with controlling what was going on with the actual land in the gypsum stack. So as 2006 grows and goes into 2011 is when they began the dredging project. And then when they began the dredging project, what happened was is the Port Manatee, they never pulled the proper insurance. They never got the insurance to make this whole thing happen, the whole dredging program. And they were going to take the dredging materials and the, and the sludge and everything else and take it and transfer it into this gypsum stack. Army Corps of Engineers, that's it, they were no-no. They kept saying no, no. There's emails and emails, which I will link up to here and I will show you on here that they were totally against using the gypsum stack as a dumping site because it would eventually rip the liner, cause leakage, cause problems, as it did. So there's many multiple emails going between people and we'll get into that deeper. But I just wanted to give you an outlook of what happened. In 2011, there was over 100 million gallons of wastewater, toxic water, that was dumped into Tampa Bay because of a tear in the liner due to the dredging program. So that's kind of a timeline and from 2011 we'll start getting into current day but I just wanted to break this down really quick to give you an idea of what was all behind this and I'm gonna have links to everything that I'm giving you that I'm sharing with you right now it's all public knowledge and so it will kind of give you a better idea of exactly what was happening. And the government, the DEP, Governor DeSantis, and a couple other people literally told HRK Holdings that they were going to be held responsible for this, that they had, there was nothing they can do about it. They were going to be blamed for it and they were going to take it. I think everyone scratches their head. What made sense with the, um, having HRK come in and do this more than a decade ago. How did that happen? Back in 2011, the state sued HRK Holdings. There's a, there is a lawsuit going on right now in 2021, 10 years later, about that whole situation where HRK is saying that DEP, which they did, had control of this whole situation. 
HRK Holdings, yes, they are to blame. Don't don't get me wrong. But it's such an underlying wag the dog over here while we do this over here. So that's exactly what the DEP and the and the government of Florida is doing is they're wagging the dog over here and blaming this person over here. And we see this all the time. So for right now, we're going to end this segment. I don't want to make them too long. So you kind of get an idea and a backstory of the beginning to now or to 2011. We'll go from 2011 until now. That will be the second part. I want to th say thank you to everybody that has supported me, that has pushed me. Uh, I'm like I said again, I'm not an activist. I'm not in this for any political motivation at all because I do not want to get in, pol in politics. Nope. Not monetary value at all. This is done because I care about what we have here. This is beautiful. This is Simmons Park. This was affected. We had a dead, uh, dead fish floating all around in here. Uh, we drove by the boat ramp and there was four boats. There's still a stigma that, oh my God, red tide, red tide. Well, we're fortunate that red tide is kind of flushed out of Tampa Bay right now. So if you want to go fishing, it is safe to go fishing. I get a lot of questions. Is it safe to eat the fish? Yes, it's safe to eat the fish. The red tide affects the, the respiratory system of the fish and not the meat. But the fish are good now. So, But I do not want to let this go. We are not letting this go. I just want to say thank you again. Please, if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me. I'll answer everything that I can.